Okay, so, so we'll move now to the keynote. So I'm really thrilled to be moderating this session today. Uh, so I just want to say, I first met Laurent 10 years ago when we were both PhD students. And at that time, Laurent still didn't have any of his six CCOM, eight NSDI, four Connex papers and beyond. So today, 10 years after, Laurent is an associate professor at ETH Zurich receiving this prestigious ACM Rising Star Award. Before joining the ETH, he was a postdoctoral research associate at Princeton University, where he worked with Jennifer Rexford, and he obtained his PhD degree in computer science from the University of Louvain in 2012. Uh, so Laurent, the stage is yours now. All right, thanks a lot, Marco, for the uh, kind words. And it's a pleasure to be introduced by you, actually a longtime friend. And uh, let me say, of course, I'm absolutely thrilled to receive this award. It's a great uh, privilege. And I'm also very happy to see that um, my colleague, uh, Adrian, and my advisor, Olivier, also received two awards at, uh, at this year's Connex. So congrats to, uh, to them. Um, uh, I had a little bit of trouble to figure out how to start this talk. And uh, I figured that one way would be to actually start at the beginning of it. Um, and the beginning for me, an important date is 2011. More precisely, the 29th of April, 2011, in the evening. And on that date, I received an email that I wish everyone here receives one day, which was an email from the SICOM chairs of 2011. And that email was to inform me that our paper on seamless network reconfiguration was accepted to SICOM. And that was my first SICOM paper and really kickstarted my research career as I, as I know it, at least uh, till, till, till this date. And what is really important to me is that I'm still working somehow on the same kind of topics as I was uh, working on, on, on this paper. So what is this paper about? Well, the question is actually pretty simple to explain. Uh, is how do we reconfigure a running network without losing reachability? So let me give you an example of this. So let us say we start with this network over here. As you can see, it's a network with only four routers, very simple one, and all the routers are forwarding traffic to a yellow destination here connected to A. So this is the initial network. And the final network configuration would be this one over there. And you can see that one big difference is how D and C reach the destination. So in the final configuration, we have D using C, while in the initial configuration, we have C using D. So now the question again is, how do we reconfigure the network? And we'll do that router by router, one node at a time, so that we never hopefully lose reachability as we are doing that. So let us start from the initial state, okay? So the initial state is, or everyone uses, or the routers are using their initial forwarding state. And let us try, let us try just for a, a moment uh, to migrate D first. So what happens if we migrate D first? Well, D will start using its final forwarding state, which directs all the traffic to C, while C is still using its initial forwarding state that directs all the traffic to D. And as you can see, hopefully here, we have created a forwarding loop. So the traffic to the yellow destination will be trapped between C and D. So this is not a good ordering. We should not use that ordering in order to reconfigure the network. So what if we use another ordering? So for instance, what if we try to reconfigure C first now? Well, if we reconfigure C first, you can see that we don't create any forwarding loops. So C will just direct the traffic to A, which is directly connected to the destination, so everything works. And once we have reconfigured C, we can safely reconfigure D to the final state as well. And once we're there, we're basically done. Uh, we can just reconfigure A and B. They don't really matter because their initial and their final forwarding state is equivalent to each other. So that was pretty easy. I'm sure uh, you agree with me to figure out how to do that. Uh, but that was in a very small network with only four routers and with one single destination. So of course, the problem is how do you do that in a large scale network with many destinations and you want to do that at the same time uh, without losing any reachability. So what we show in this second paper that uh, is more than a decade old now is that finding this ordering is actually hard. So what I mean by hard is that it's actually NP complete to decide if an ordering exists. That means that there is a pretty low chance that we'll ever uh, find an algorithm to be efficient in any kind of networks. 
Yet, this is in theory. In practice, we show that it is actually possible to find ordering in many situations, and we describe algorithms and heuristics in, in the paper. We also design an entire orchestration system, which is able to compute these orderings and then apply them to the routers directly. So that was my first SICOM paper in 2011. So now I would like to show you my last SICOM paper in 2021, so this year. And this was a paper uh, with uh, PhD students of mine here at ETH. And this paper is about network reconfigurations. Uh, it's about, I give you an initial and a final configuration, and then we try to synthesize correct updates that bring the network from the initial configuration to the final one. That sounds pretty similar, right? And at this point, you might just think that we are just redoing always the same thing in our group. And I would actually contest that vividly. So I think the papers that we have been writing in 2011 and 2021, even though they look similar, I mean, they certainly look at similar problems, but actually your paper in 21 is more general, more expressive, but also way more efficient. And this actually is the result of being able to reason about ne distributed network computations. And that is like a big difference with respect to 2011 where we couldn't reason about computation at all. We're assuming we're given the graph and we're just ordering updates to this forwarding graph without thinking about computation ever. So in this talk, I want to present a little bit our journey enabling this reasoning about distributed computation that took us almost a decade to reach this point. So first I need to lay a little bit the foundation here. So what do I mean by distributed computation? So distributed computation in many networks rule over the forwarding behavior. So the forwarding behavior of many ISPs, many data centers are actually completely dictated by the output of a distributed algorithm. So typically actually multiple distributed algorithms, routing algorithms. So these routing algorithms are running on each node in your network and they are computing the forwarding state of each node in your network. So this is the output of these distributed algorithms. The input of these distributed algorithms, I would like to name three of them. Well, you have a configuration. Each device has a configuration in your network defining the behavior of these algorithms. You have a topology, and then you have the external routes. So any kind of like external routing information you may learn from your neighbor. So there is one thing missing in this picture though, is the operator, the network operators. So here, the network operators, I would like you to think of them as computation designer, really. So if you are an, um, a network operator, when you need to do what you are doing on a day-to-day -day basis is figuring out how to organize a computation, a distributed computation, so that it computes what you want in the end. You probably have some objectives about how you want you know, your network to forward traffic. Then you need to figure out a way to organize these algorithms so that they compute a compatible forwarding state. And the way you, to do that is for you to figure out values for like thousands of knobs that are actually the configurations of these algorithms that will influence the behavior of, uh, of these routing algorithms. So to go, back, to go back to my picture here, so the network operators they have a high level specification about the forwarding behavior of the network. You may have heard the term intents before. So this is one thing that they typically have in their heads, unfortunately only, but th there is an objective. Uh, most likely about the network behavior. And so the job is to kind of like invert these distributed algorithms and figure out the input configuration that will make the algorithms compute a forwarding state which is compatible with their forwarding intents. And there is a massive gap here. Uh, there is a semantic gap between the high level specification, which can be, for instance, I don't know, I want to enable load balancing in my network versus the configuration that will enable to do that, that might pertain to configuring, I don't know, link weights on each and every single router in your network. And bridging this gap is very hard. And so I could do the easy way to illustrate this, the hardness of the problem would be to just show you a long stream of outages that have happens where it's obvious that network operators make mistakes while configuring the networks. Just one example would be in October 21. So only two months ago, Facebook, the entire Facebook infrastructure went down for hours. I'm sure most of you know that, uh, including Instagram and WhatsApp because of the configuration changes that went haywire. But I don't want to do that. I don't want just like to list configuration mistakes. 
Instead, I would like to illustrate this once a little bit more visually. And so I would like to show you as visually as I can, the impact of human operations on internet connectivity. And in order to do that, I would like to use our students as, uh, as guinea pigs. So a little bit of context here. So in each year at ETH, I'm teaching the introduction to communication networks. And in this lecture, we do a large scale projects with all the students. So we have around 120 students in our classrooms nowadays. So we have 120 students who operate concurrently a mini internet infrastructure. So we divide these 120 students into groups and each group receives an autonomous system, a virtual network that is composed of around 10 routers. And then they are responsible for configuring the network. And then we interconnect all these networks together and that forms an internet. And the cool thing we can do is to actually keep track and, and measure really in real time, the internet connectivity uh, in this mini internet platform. And we'll present that as you can see here as a matrix, as a connectivity matrix. And should be pretty explicit what it is. So we have a matrix where lines and columns are groups. So uh, for instance, the network of group one, group two, group three, et cetera. And then you can see a green cell where group I is able to reach group J through the mini internet. Okay, so green is good. Green means the internet is working between these two groups. Of course, red is bad. It means that group I is not able to reach group J. It means that there is an outage um, the internet is not working in between these two uh, groups. It doesn't necessarily mean that these two groups are at fault. It could be, for instance, a common provider that does not work. So as I said, we run this uh, mini internet platform and then we ask the students, I mean, their end goal in the project is to enable any to any connectivity like in the internet. So we start with a matrix, which is pretty much red uh, with around 10% of connectivity. Typically only the internal connect connectivity is working. And then as I will show you, this matrix will start to turn gray. Uh, so it's a little bit of Christmas season with red and green blinking. And what I would like to, for you to keep in mind is the appearance of all these red um, cells. So whenever you see a red cells, think of it as an outage in the internet, which is really due to human operations. So let me actually play this uh, little movie here and let me get out of the way for one second. So as you can see, the matrix is turning green, mostly green, but at the same time, you have a lot of red uh, cells that appear and sometimes entire lines and columns. So that's when an entire network fails um, to, uh, to work. So the Cool thing, though, is that at the end of the projects, we ended up with a mostly green matrix. So at the end of the project this year, uh, while it was done entirely remotely, we ended up with 98% connectivity in our internet. So as you can see, most of the cells are working. There was a problem with, with one, only one single network. But again, here, what is important to keep in mind is that the impact of human operation is, is I hope, very visual. Um, and, and you can see, you would have, I think, the same kind of pictures, of course, in the internet. Of course, it's, the internet does not bootstrap uh, like our mini internet at the beginning of the semester. If you are interested, by the way, in running this project um, in your classroom, or if you are a TA yourself, you would like to do that next time, uh, please check out our uh, repository. It's, everything is open source. Um, you can really easily, I think, run these uh, kind of projects. It scales well. You only need one server for around 120 uh, students. And multiple universities uh, now have been starting to use it with, I think, good success. So uh, check it out. It's, uh, it's on GitHub. All right. So I hope I could illustrate um, this, the hardness now and the complexity of bridging this gap between the high-level specification that you have in your head and the low-level configuration, the knobs that you need to turn in order to constrain the behavior of these distributed computations. So for the last 10 years now, since I know Marco, we have been working on um, trying to help the operators bridging this gap. And we have been doing this uh, considering three different directions. One direction is the verification direction, another one is the synthesis direction, and then the last one is the reconfiguration direction, which I mentioned already. So what do I mean by, by this? So verification, so oh, by the way, all of these directions start with the same, from the same starting point, which is a high level specification. So in the context of verification, 
What you have is the high level specification and a configuration. And then your problem is to figure out whether the configuration that I'm giving you is indeed compliant, will constrain the algorithms in such a way that their output will be compliant with the high level specification. So at the end of the day, you will return true or false. And if you return false, you will typically give a counterexample why the network is not compliant with uh, the specification. So observe here that I'm thinking about the computation in the forward direction of the input config. And I'm trying to reason whether this input config will induce a good output behavior. So I'm running it forward. Synthesis is running the computation backwards now. So I only have the high level specification as an input. And then the task is to produce a configuration which is compliant with this specification. So now I have only uh, a property about the output and I need to run the computation backwards in order to figure out the input. So that's what I mean by running the computation backward. Then reconfiguration is kind of like running the computation sideways, if you wish. You have a high level specification and you also have now multiple configuration, multiple inputs, each of them inducing different outputs. And then you need to figure out a way to kind of like switch from one input to another in order to meet the specification at any intermediate stage. That's a reconfiguration problem. So we have been working on these three directions for uh, the last decade. And I would like to mention one example, one representative example of, of works in each of the direction uh, for verification going forward, synthesis going backwards, and then reconfiguration going sideways. In case you're wondering, by the way, about this uh, weird looking font here, it's actually an ambigram. Um, so I hope you can read configuration over there. And an ambigram is a word that you can read in two directions uh, visually. So you can, of course, read it from left to right. But if you turn your head, you should also be able to read it um, with a 180 degrees rotation. Actually, let me show you this uh, with a little animation to kind of like make it pop. So, all right. So now let's look at how we deal with this configuration. First in the forward direction, then the backward direction, and then we'll go sideways and we'll try to do the full rotation, 180 degrees. So verification first. So here I would like to speak about probabilistic verification. So as I was mentioning you, verification is the problem of you get a property and a configuration and you would like to figure out whether the configuration meets a property at all time. That's classical verification. In probabilistic verification, what we are interested in is computing the probability at which the property will be verified or not. And this probability depends typically of failures. So if you have a property in your network, let's say it load balances the traffic, that property may be true when all the links are up, but it may be violated in some cases because of specific links failing at some points, for instance. So it's important to compute probabilities, especially when you think about SLAs, for instance, service level agreements. So I'm sure you have heard about those, um, or like um, you have heard people speaking about, let's say, a 4.9 SLA. So what it means is that you have a property, for instance, reachability, that you would like to be guaranteed as an operator 99.99% of the time. So that means that the property can only be violated 0.01% or less of the time. So why not 100%? Well, sometimes it's, not, it's just not possible for many properties to, be, to hold 100%. Even if you think about reachability, uh, there is always a chance that your network becomes disconnected because of concurrent failures. The probability might be small, but it's not zero. So asking for your network to always be reachable, it's actually ill-defined. It's not possible. So that's why we want to be able to compute the probability at which a property is verified. And you also find this very uh, often in the context of performance, for instance, load balancing, traffic engineering, et cetera. So the problem to compute the probability of a property is that you need to consider the different failure scenarios with, um, with which um, the network will react, okay? And then you need to see whether in these different scenarios, the property that you care about is still met or not. And you need to do that with a high precision. So in the case of covering a, nine, a four nines SLA, you need to cover a probability mass of 99.99% of the cases. So you need to explore enough failure scenarios to cover 99.99% of the cases. 
So the big challenge is how do we explore the space of failures? By the way, you will see that across all my um, little um, talks here, or little introductions to these different works, that one of the key challenges is how do we navigate the search space? So the search spaces that are always to be way too big. And so we need to find techniques that enable us to navigate them in an efficient way. So in the context of probabilistic um, verification, how do we do that? Well, one way you could think about solving the problem is, I mean, the most perhaps naive way would be to say, I will just go in decreasing order of probabilities. So if you think about a network, the most likely outcome of a, of a network is that all the links, everything is working fine. At least you hope that this is the most likely one, otherwise you have big problems. So you will first check whether the property holds when all the links are up, all the nodes are up, and then you will check whether the property holds when only one single link fail, where two single links fail, three single links, et cetera, et cetera. And you can do this effectively considering a decreasing order of likelihood in the different scenarios. The issue is that if you want to reach this 99.99% precision I was, I was mentioning, which is very common, I mean, four nines SLA is actually not that stringent. Five nine SLA is often seen in practice. So if you want to cover a four nine SLA, and compute the probability with the right uh, accuracy, you need to consider in a network with around 200 links, more than 1 million failure scenarios. So you would need to run your verification um, engine on more than 1 million uh, scenarios. So considering, for instance, a Batfish as one verification engine, on such a network, Batfish would take on, on average around 30 seconds. So that is a long time to wait in order to check that the property holds in 99.99% of the cases. So it doesn't scale. So you might think, okay, what about sampling? Uh, what if instead of like just considering these uh, scenarios one after the other, I just sample them randomly. How many do I need before I reach uh, a good enough accuracy that I can verify a 99.99 SLA? And here it's even worse. Um, you actually need more than 700 millions now, test cases or failure cases in order to reach um, the accuracy that you want. So that's of course even worse, uh, many orders of magnitude worse. So in, in our paper, in this, in this paper that we presented at SICCOM in 2020, so last year, we actually designed NetDice that enables to do this check uh, exploring around um, 1,800 um, failure scenarios. So much, much uh, less than even partial exploration, actually six times 100 less. So the, the key insight in NetDice is how do we prune and navigate the search space of all the failures? And I would like to give you really only the gist of the idea. And of course, there are many more details in the paper, but the gist of the idea is to try to figure out which failures matter in the network. So if I give you, for instance, this simple network here, uh, we have small networks with six nodes. It uses shortest pass routing. So consider that all the links have a weight of one and only one link has a weight of two. So if you compute the shortest pass between A and B, you should quickly see that the shortest pass is, is depicted here in green. So you go low and then up. That's the shortest pass between A and B. So let's think a little bit about what kind of failures could change this forwarding path. So if clearly, if I have a failure alongside the shortest path, for instance, this link here with the arrow, if that link goes down, the network will reconverge. In this case, it will reconverge to use the upper path instead of a lower one. So clearly failures alongside the shortest path impact the forwarding path in your network. They matter, okay? But what about this failure over here? As you can see, this failure here, if that link fails, this link will, this failure will not impact the forwarding pass. I mean, the shortest pass between A and B is not impacted by that link failure. You can think of it that way. So we call all the edges that do not change, that do not lead to a change of forwarding pass, cold. So this means that a failure of these edges will not impact the forwarding pass in any way. And in the case of shortest pass routing, it's pretty easy to compute them. It's all the edges that are not lying on the shortest pass. So this is not really, that doesn't get you a second paper, but the uh, main contribution of, of NetDice is to actually do that for not only shortest pass routing, but for all routing protocols, the commonly used ones, so including BGP. So the cool thing here 
is that once you have done this uh, cold edge identification, any failures, any subset of failures of this cold edge, as I said, will not impact the probability, uh, will not impact the probability of a property that you would check on that forwarding path. So that's nice because in this case, there are uh, two to the five uh, failure scenarios that you can consider with only a single one. So as I said, our biggest contribution is to identify these cold edges automatically and automatically for you for the different routing protocols, including BGP. And it's hard because you need, whenever you're considering BGP, you need to consider all kinds of like quirks, like network partition, route reflection, or the fact that BGP depends on the IGP as well, which creates even more problems. Um, so I would refer you to the paper if you are interested, but just let me tell you that we actually proved that this cold edge identification is correct. So there is a correctness proof there as well. So this is what we do in NetDice. We identify the cold edge, check whether the property holds for them or not. And then we explore the remaining part of the failure space, the, the ones that concern the odd edges. And then we compute the probability of the property holding for them. Of course, it might still be too much. So we, in the paper, also describe techniques to prune the search space even more. And one of them is to avoid exploring very unlikely scenarios, but still we, while keeping the precision, uh, so still while being able to verify 99.99% SLS. The efficiency of our algorithms depend on the amount of cold edges there are. And it turns out that in practice, as we show, it works very well. So in practice, there are a lot of cold edges which allow us really to have a knockout effect on the running time. So if you are interested, the, the implementation is open source. Again, it's on GitHub, and we implement uh, the, the check for many commonly found um, properties. In terms of runtimes, it only takes a few minutes for large networks with hundreds of links to verify a 4.9 SLA. And what we were very happy to see is that in 80% of the scenarios, the majority of the links are cold. So that means that the majority of the search space can be trimmed uh, directly. And I did not speak about that, but we also consider different um, complexities in terms of the properties we can verify. And what we show in the paper is that the um, complexity or the, the running time nicely degrades um, with the complexity of the property. And we also use real configuration and show that it works with real configuration. So the conclusion is that NetDice is precise and efficient, and it can compute very precisely and very efficiently the probability of a property holding or not in your network. So that was for the forward direction. Now I would like to speak a little bit about the backward direction. So synthesis of like requirements on the output of my network. And I would like to figure out what kind of like configuration I need in order for these requirements to be met. So let me switch gear and speak about NetComplete. So NetComplete is a, is a paper that we published at NSDI in 2018. And the idea of NetComplete is to, as the name indicates, auto-complete partial configuration. So the idea is that you as an operator, you would give me a sketch of the configuration. So perhaps you know that you want to use protocol one and two, and you know that some parameters value for protocol one and two, but you do not know all of them. So it's a little bit like you have a partial program where you know the, let's say the beginning of the program, the end of the program, but you do not know the core of the program. And then you give me this like partial configuration together with what is it that you want the network to do? So you give me the high level requirements. So this configuration sketch could look for instance, something like this. So it looks like an, um, a network configuration, but you can see that there are like um, red pieces here uh, on the slides. So these red pieces are undefined. You do not know them as an operator. So the goal is, the goal of NetComplete is to be able to auto-complete these red parts automatically and give, give you like a complete configuration that means the high level requirements. So we want to go from this to that. So as you can see here, all the red parts are green and have been filled and are concrete. So by the way, another advantage of working with this partial sketch is that as an operator, you can really control the, what is it that the synthesize or synthesize instead of like synthesizing everything, which might lead to crazy configurations that people cannot reason about. We allow the people to bring us an almost complete configuration. And then we just give them the final boost to complete the configuration. 
So how do we solve that problem? What's, what's the trick? Well, we solve that problem by reducing it to a constraint satisfaction problem. So what, what I mean by this is that we actually turn the entire problem into a big formula, a logical formula. We take all the protocol semantics, all the high level requirements, all the partial configuration, then we smoosh them together into a Boolean formula here using SMT um, constraints. And then once we have this gigantic formula that captures everything, we then give that to a solver. And in this formula, there will be some variables that are left unassigned. These are the variables that correspond to the holes in my configuration. And what I'm asking the solver to do is to find actual assignments for these variables that make the entire formula evaluates to true, meaning that the configuration will be concrete. I will know the full configuration. And although I will know that, also I will know that this configuration meets a requirement is, is correct. As I said, again, it should not be surprising to you, but the main challenge here is scalability. Uh, if you do this naively, you will end up with a humongous formula that will be very hard to solve, or will never be able to solve. So again, what is it that we do? Where well, we use techniques to train the search space, we make it smaller. And we also use technique to navigate the search space in a little bit, uh, in a better way. So instead of just randomly sampling through the search space. And here, I just want to give you one insight about this process applied again to shortest pass routing. So here, consider this simple network again. Again, simple example, four routers, A, B, C, D. You have like the given link weights are given and you can see that right now, the traffic between A and C goes via the direct link between A and C. So now let us say that the operators, they're not so happy about this forwarding. And what they would like really, if there is a lot of traffic between A and C, is to use more than one path. So they want to enable load balancing in the network. So how do you do that? Uh, what set of weights do you need in order for this to happen? And here, I just need to tell you that in order for these routers to load balance traffic, you need the two paths, the two green paths to have the same cost, the same weight, the same sum of weights, if you wish. So how could you solve that using constraints? Well, it's actually not that hard if you think about it a little bit. So what you want, this is a synthesis procedure, is you want all the paths between A and C, which are not the green paths, to have a higher cost than the green path. So if you do this, then you ensure that A, A will use only the green path to reach C, because all the other paths will be higher, or have a higher cost. At the same time, as I said, you also want the two green paths to have the same cost in order for the traffic to be load balanced in the first place. So you can enumerate all the possible paths, you can generate this constraint, and then you can give that to a solver. And then you will get this, for instance, as an output. This is one example of an output. And as you can see, this is a correct uh, output. I have the two green paths with a cost of 300, and you can check that all the other paths have a higher cost than 300. This is cool, it works. The problem is it doesn't scale. It doesn't scale in large networks because perhaps you remember this from your lectures on the graph theory, but enumerating all the paths, it's actually an exponential um, step. It's exp exponential in the number of nodes. So in large, in large graph, enumerating all the paths just doesn't work at all. So this is something that we need to combat. And so how do we do that? Well, in, in the case of Netcompete, we use this insight uh, that comes from program synthesis, which is known as counterexample guided inductive synthesis or SEGIS. So this is a little bit of brutal name to say that what we do essentially is that we will try. And then if, we, if it doesn't work, if we make a mistake, we will learn from a mistake and then get better over time. So we are getting better and better as we are trying. That's in, in a nutshell the intuition behind SEGIS. So here the, the, the problem was enumerating all these paths. So we don't want to do that, we won't do this. So instead of enumerating all the paths between X and Y, we will only take a subset of them. So if there are like 1000 paths, let me only take 10 of them. And then I will synthesize the weights only considering 10 instead of the 1000 paths. So I will get some weights. The problem is that I might be wrong. So these weights might be completely bogus because I didn't consider 1000, I only considered 10. But the insight here is that checking if a weighted graph implements the forwarding that you care about, the property that you care about, this is super easy because you can just run Dijkstra on the weighted graph and n log n, you get this. 
So the issue here is we try with a subset of the pass, we get some weights, we check them using Dijkstra, and then if it doesn't work, then we need to repeat the process. And we repeat the process by adding to our 10 pass a, set, a subset of the paths that do not work. And it might be a little bit confusing what I'm saying right now. So let me illustrate this with an example that I think will make things quite clear. Lorame, Same thing as before. Lorame, just one thing, I, I just to let you know that we are at 35 minutes now. All right, okay. So yeah. that okay, good. Um, okay. I, will, I will finish in the next five minutes. So uh, yeah, thanks. So just to finish here. So we, we start with this um, initial graph. And what we do is we'll only consider one pass uh, instead of all of them. So let, let us just consider the red pass here, A, B, C, D. So what we will ask the solver to do is to figure out weights so that the A, B, C, D pass has a higher cost than the two green pass. We give that to the solver and we'll get weights out. So here, if you compute the extra on this graph, it should be easy to see that it's wrong. So the actual shortest paths go A, B, C. And this is a path that we did not consider. So the idea now is to augment the set of sample paths with A, B, C, and then repeat the process. And what we did is to implement that. And we showed that in practice, this entire step converges very, very quickly. In a few iterations, we are able to find weights that are correct. All right, so briefly, uh, because I'm running out of time, about the reconfiguration, what I would like to mention is just this SNOCAP paper, so the, this 2021 paper, the big difference with the 2011 paper is the fact that we take as input now the configuration. As I told you, in 2011, what we took as input was the forwarding path, the output of the algorithms. Now we take the input of the algorithm, the configuration. So what SNOCAP does is given this configuration, I and F, initial and final, and some specification about the intermediate states, it automatically figure out some ordering uh, to, to apply them. And again, challenge, you guessed it. Search space is huge and search space is very sparse. And so here I will skip this part, but just to give you the gist of the idea is we also use a counterexample guided search like NetComplete, but apply now to reconfiguration ordering. So this is, I think, a technique that you should perhaps know about and try to learn more about because it's quite generic. And it works very, very well. So it's very actually quick to compute orderings and it also find good orderings that are correct, as you can see here. So I will just finish now on some perspective about computations. So as I told you, what we have been doing in the past is looking at the forward direction, the backward direction, and then the sideways direction. So I think there is still plenty to do in the space. Uh, and there are still many, I think deep and interesting questions that are completely left in touch. One of them relates to complexity, for instance. So right now, as you, as you may have seen, we are using constraint solving, SMT solving, to solve the synthesis questions and some of the verification questions. But really, I don't think we have a good grasp of the complexity, uh, comp computational complexity of many of these questions. And it might be that uh, using SMT solving is actually not necessary at all because there exists uh, some nice polynomial time algorithm, for instance. Another point which I think would be interesting to look at in the future is the question of simplicity. So we are using very complex protocols today. So what is the most simple distributed routing protocol we could come up with, which is expressive enough to do whatever we want to do with them or whatever the operators want to do with them without uh, being so damn hard to synthesize or, or verify? I think this would be also an interesting question. And then the last question I will, I will finish with this is the question of learnability. So writing the models to invert computation, it's very hard. So it, took, it takes a PhD student roughly a semester, six months to do that. But you could imagine trying to learn this automatically. And I think here there is an area where machine learning could be very interesting because machine learning is good at approximating functions. So you could actually encompass the distributed algorithm as a function and try machine learning and then try to learn the inverse of that function. So that's something we're exploring now, for instance. On this, I would like to finish with a picture of my, of my group because really they did most of the work I'm, I'm talking about here. Uh, so they really deserve uh, a lot of the credit and uh, their names are there. And also I'm of course indebted to all the alumni, collaborators and my mentors, uh, of course, Olivier and, and Jen 
and all my colleagues for, uh, for the last 10 years. Um, and I'm looking forward, of course, to the next 10. On this, uh, I'm sorry I took a little bit more time. I would be happy to finish now and then take some questions. And uh, by the way, as you can see, we are hiring. So uh, I would be happy to receive uh, your applications. Thanks. Thanks, Laura. Um, so that was absolutely fantastic talk to open Connect. And uh, I believe actually yes, verification outages. We actually experienced an outage yesterday with Connex registration because of an AWS network outage. We probably didn't know, but again, Connex was also um, affected by network outages. So definitely spot on for uh, as a keynote. Uh, so, so what I would like to do, uh, so first to ask the attendees to ask questions on uh, Slack. We already have one. Um, and actually the, the one that has been asked by Morley is the same one that I wanted to ask you. So as I said, we, we met 10 years ago, right? And then you didn't have any sitcom and any SDI, you were starting your career. So what I would like to ask you is basically what would be your advice that you would give to PhD students today who are starting? So, and what, what is your secret source? So, uh, source? Because uh, when I work with you, it always looks like things are simple. But they are not, right? So, so I would like to, to hear a little bit from you, basically, uh, as, as also Morley is asking, so how to select the right promising research problems to work on that can generate impact in the community, any recipe for successful research, particularly for grad students? Yeah, well, it, it's, uh, it's, I mean, it's a very hard question to answer. It's, uh, I don't, I mean, of course, it's not like there is a recipe that I can just lay over. Um, but I, I can try to describe a little bit our process or my process when thinking about this problem. So really what I think what, what really enabled me to like, start it, and I was struggling at the beginning of my PhD for almost two years. Uh, so I, I started my PhD uh, in, in, uh, in late 2008, but my first second paper was in 2011. So it's not like things magically clicked from the get-go. Uh, but what really clicked, I think, uh, circa 2011 is that we were really able to um, pose the, the research question, the research problem very, very clearly. And we really started with the example I showed with these four routers. And then what about we have an initial configuration, final configuration, and then yeah, there is a loop that can appear. And so really starting with a concrete example kind of unlocked us and enabled us to develop this entire thing starting from it. So um, my advice would be I mean, but it's it's just an advice, and I realize I've, I've been receiving many advice over my career now, and I realize not all of them are, are really actionable. But here, what I would like to try to, uh, to, to push students for is to look for uh, research problem, research questions that they can really explain easily at first. Uh, so like, for instance, the one I was considering at the beginning of my talk. And then if you can explain the problem easily, uh, usually you are onto a good thing. Uh, it means that you can also write the intro in an easy way. You don't need like two pages of background before you can actually explain what the problem is. So going for, of course, simple problems take time because you need to be able to identify them. So here, another piece of advice would be to discuss, at least in my area, it's good to discuss with operators and then figure out what, I mean, what is it that they are struggling with? And that's when also we realize that Operators are not struggling to configure a network from scratch. Um, they are struggling to reconfigure a network. And this is what they do all the time. And they're changing little things here and there, and then they didn't know how to do that. And so here, of course, it's hard to, uh, to, to discuss with many operators, but I would recommend, for instance, the, uh, the operators conference like Nanog or RIPE, all the talks are online. And I learned a lot um, by actually going through them. And, and trying to figure out what is it that they were actually saying between the lines, because they are operational people. They are not trying to uh, describe anything in terms of algorithms, but they are trying to, uh, they are trying to solve real problems. And so being able to, to kind of like put them back into a, a concrete research question is, is of course something that needs a lot of training. Um, so that's, that's one, two advices, let's say, on, on how to pick questions. I think the kind of like problems I like is the ones that also mix um, theory and practice. So uh, th the best paper I think I've been working on, you have like nice algorithms, you have nice proof, a little bit of complexity theory, that's a nice touch uh, as well, I think. And, and then you have, a, I hope, a strong implementation and also a strong evaluation on real networks. And when you have a research question that enables you, where you see that there is a good and interesting um, 
theoretical question as well behind. I think it's it's something absolutely, um, I mean, that you are onto, onto something. And here, I would really advise everyone to really be able to go in depth in at least one um, area which is not computer networks. So pick anything, algorithms, com complexity theory, uh, graph theory, anything, um, but know something else than just networking so that you can try to find matches and clicks and you can start to solve problems using other techniques because networking is a great field for uh, applied problems, but we don't solve problems using networking techniques. We solve problems using techniques that come from other areas. And, um, and here, I think it's really important to know other areas. And you don't need to know more than one other area to be able to, to write papers, I think, and, and, and do very good research. Uh, but you need at least one. And then over time, you can expand uh, on that. So uh, yeah, I hope it wasn't too long widened as, a, as an answer, but these are the, some, some tips and, and, and tricks that, that comes to mind. Um, yeah. yeah, I think actually it was very insightful and, um, and you have been very successful uh, in the last years to also create those collaborations, uh, let's say cross-disciplinary collaborations with programming languages, especially I would say. Yeah, correct. Yes, yes. So here, I think definitely, I mean, it's good that you mentioned that you, um, I think it's good to learn about the other areas, um, but it's also, of course, good co to collaborate with people in these other areas. And so, uh, I mean, most university places you have like, uh, I mean, you have many areas that are present and uh, absolutely, I would like to encourage people to, to go and talk to other people than just their own, their own group. And so that's something that, of course, I got inspired by, by Jennifer Rexford. So she was my postdoc advisor and she was working a lot with programming language and still is working a lot with programming language people, Dave Walker, not to name him, at Princeton. And so when I arrived at, at ETH, I actually did, I wanted to kind of like emulate as well uh, footsteps. I mean, Jen is a good person to try to emulate. And, uh, and I started to discuss and, and build really collaborations with programming language um, people. And I think they have like a great set of tools, uh, but it's not the only area with great set of tools, like control theory people would be other areas, um, another area with a lot of tools to think about, or machine learning uh, nowadays would also be another area, or algorithmic uh, graph, gra graph theory would be yet another one. So really like just look for adjacent areas and talk to these people and try to collaborate with them. Um, that has been very fruitful and very successful for me, but it took some time, right? It's not like, I mean, this is easy and it, it takes really time to do that, but in the end it's worth it for sure, yeah. Okay, thanks a so, so we have some questions now. Uh, actually, we have a queue of questions now on Slack. Uh, so, so, so I'll go through, through them. Um, so, so one question is actually related to this, uh, yes, to this initial paper that you mentioned about reconfigurations and being there very common problem. So the question is, how big of a deal is the ordering problem initial to final configuration in large scale production environments? Have you interacted with service providers to understand the impact of this problem? Identifying the yeah. final config and checking if, if it results in negative performance, impact is more challenging. How much downtime if you get ordering wrong and how do you troubleshoot? Yeah. Well, it's a bit, it's a long question, a big it's, one. It's a long. It's, I would uh, say definitely the impact with um, service providers. That, that's, that yeah, sounds very yes, cool. yes. Yeah. So it, it's a great question. So let me try to unfold it bit by bit. So first, um, yes, it is a problem for sure. So we did actually I did measurements in my thesis all the way back to my PhD thesis. Uh, we had the uh, the chance of working with um, with actual operators, and I measured the amount of changes they were performing every day. It was in a tier one uh, network. And we observe like hundreds of config change per day. Of course, these are not huge changes. Um, these might concern a few routers, but these changes happen literally every day in large network hundreds of times. So not all of them are problematic. Many changes are quite trivial and will not induce uh, forwarding problems, but there is a non negligible percentage. And it's hard for me to give you one number because it really depends on what, what is it that you're trying to achieve. But what we did show is that there were absolutely uh, critical changes that the operators were performing. So in existing network that were leading to huge traffic shift and huge, loss, huge losses. Actually, just to give you one concrete um, citation here that unfortunately I removed the slide this morning because I thought I was, I was anyway too long and, and I was too long, but there were some recent studies from Alibaba, which maintains of course very large networks. And they were, they were saying, 
interestingly, that 56% of the problems they have in their network can be traced back to a configuration update. 56%. So that's the majority of the problems they have is due to config changes. Um, at least if I'm interpreting the citations right. So it's a pretty big problem. And the Facebook uh, example is an example of a config change that went wrong. So yes, I think it's, uh, it's a practical issue and, um, and uh, it's still not solved. I mean, it's not like the techniques that we are, um, that we've been developing are well used in practice yet. So that's something I think we should do a better job in the future is trying really to do the last step and really trying to deploy not only like take the problems from uh, from the operators, but really also try to solve it in practice and really deploy it. That's something we didn't do as much as I wanted, uh, but something I, I look forward to doing in the future. Actually, yeah. I hope that answered the question. If not, I can be on Slack by the way later to answer. Yeah, the so, so here more. we have many uh, interesting questions, and I, now I need, I need to pick. I, I think maybe we have time for two, and uh, and maybe short answers. Um, yeah. So, so there's a one one question that I think is very interesting for everyone, which is um, um, this is from Marco Melia. So, my question would be: How much of these works moved from research to applications, and how to make this happen eventually? Startup collaboration with companies, research projects funded by public bodies. Um, yes. Yeah. So, uh, hi, Marco. First, um, it's uh, so Avon we. As I was, I was just saying, we, we haven't done the jump enough. So we do discuss with operators. We tell them about our techniques. But it's one thing to tell them that these techniques exist and that there is a GitHub repo with the evaluation uh, and the artifact there and really do the job together with them to deploy in practice. So we haven't done that uh, just yet. And I think one way that I can see would be, for instance, to um, to, I mean, to go and present our, our research to, uh, I mean, to these meetings I was mentioning, Nanoc, right? Uh, also go to the ITF, something that my advisor, Olivier, has been doing for a long, long time and got him a lot of collaborations and impact as well. Also now he has a startup. So I think, uh, yeah, I think that would be the way I see forward. Um, but um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it has to be done. I think it cannot only remain as a, as a paper. It only starts with the paper, but it shouldn't end there by, by any means. Uh, but it's, it's hard, it takes time. And of course, it reduces the throughput somehow of, of, of research. So that's, that's one price to pay, but you get benefit later on. Yeah. Great, great, thanks. Uh, so last question. Um, so so this, this is more technical. So, so in, during your keynote, you talked about uh, verification for probabilistic failures. And then one of the properties that you mentioned, I guess also for the sake of simplicity was reachability. So the question yeah. is, uh, can you actually apply those type of techniques also to other properties rather than availability? So for instance, here one example is uh, network level security abuses. And I would also add uh, something because that was also my question, uh, performance in general. So for instance, if you, uh, when you have these cold edges, uh, I guess the moment you have some flows going through them and you, you look at uh, ut link utilization, then you have casc cascade effects. So it's harder probably to have those cold edges, if I understood correctly. But in general, if you yeah, have yeah. also congestion control and performance, I know it's very hard to do verification there. So what, what would be your take? Yeah, so uh, first great question. And I think, by the way, uh, performance verification I can see it as a next interesting area for us to work on, and I think for the community to work on, um, because it's mostly unsolved. It's very hard, very, very hard. Um, but what we did in NetDice is reasoning about essentially forwarding properties. So we are reasoning about properties on the forwarding graph. We are not reasoning about properties about the traffic flowing alongside this forwarding graph. That doesn't mean you cannot reason about performance. So to give you an example, you might be very interested as an operator in the probability that the traffic that enters, let's say on the East Coast, leaves via the West Coast. Because you would like, of course, that the traffic does not cross your entire network too often because it costs money to do that and also requires resources to do that. Of course, it could happen, right? That you have failures that are such that the traffic needs to leave on the West Coast. And so this would be an example. Uh, you would like then to figure out what is the probability of this happening in my network? Uh, what is the probability of me having more than, I don't know, four paths between uh, Boston and New York, for instance, because I know then that I have no congestion issue because this is the capacity I need between these two nodes. Um, 
now, as I said, we don't reason about the actual traffic that goes there. Uh, as you said, we would need, it's very hard to do because then we need a model of the sourcing of this traffic, um, which tends very, I mean, it tends to be messy uh, quickly, unless you, you can reason at the very high level, at the aggregate level. And here, perhaps I want to refer to some of the, of course, like there's a, an entire literature library on traffic engineering. And, and people have been, I mean, you, Marco, as well, have been working on this problem of traffic engineering. And uh, I think the two fields connect, um, but how exactly, I think it's, it's really an open question not to, to also take uh, full, um, traffic predicates into account and verify them. Um, it's not something we have been working on, and it's not something that NetDice does, uh, just to be clear, uh, but would be terrific if someone can, uh, can make that happen. Yeah. Okay, so, so Laurent, thanks again for your keynote. I, I would just also thanks. like to add a final note, which is uh, thanks for making the teaching material public. So beyond the mini internet, there's also a P4 tutorial that we have been using, and it's uh, really great. So thanks a lot also for making everything public. Yeah, yeah thanks for mentioning it. It's on GitHub. If you are interested, you can also uh, see it. It's true, we have a, an entire lecture on uh, data plane programmability. We have a lot of exercises, uh, all corrected and well, I think, documented. So um, yeah, if you, it's not only about configurations, uh, indeed, yes, thanks.